um, I, I want you to travel back in history with me for just a moment. Uh, it's the early 1930s in Germany, and dangerous ideas were beginning to take root. Um, ideas that in time would have devastating consequences. Uh, these ideas were first talked about in, in a pub, in a beer hall in Munich, Germany, uh, among a political group. And these political ideas became social ideas and religious ideas. And eventually, what was first talked about in a beer hall in Munich, it became an evil philosophy, an easy, an evil way of seeing you know, the world. Um, and, and this philosophy, this worldview would sweep not only through Germany, but it, it would sweep through various parts of Europe. Um, years later, this doctrine that began in a pool hall, you know, a beer hall in, in Munich, uh, became known among the Nazi leadership as the final solution to the Jewish question, the final solution to the Jewish question. Um, by the late 1930s, fast forward a few years, uh, Germany has annexed countries like Austria and the Czech Republic um, into its borders as it's initiating its plans for what it referred to as territorial expansion. And, and then in 1939, Germany invaded Poland and that would mark the beginning of World War II. Uh, over the next couple of years, Germany would end up invading much of Europe and occupying much of Europe along with North Africa. Um, by 1941 and into the early parts of 1941, uh, the final solution to the Jewish question began to be implemented as the Nazis began to build extermination camps or death camps uh, in Germany-occupied Poland. Uh, over the next few years, uh, the Jewish population, which at the end of the 1930s numbered 9 million, there were 9 million Jews at the end of the 1930s all throughout Europe, uh, they were about to, however, suffer unimaginable catastrophic loss. Uh, Nazi Germany and the axis of evil would end up slaughtering over 6 million Jewish people uh, in their attempt at racial purification. And, and I will just say time out and pause for just a moment on this. Don't ever forget that ideas have consequences. Uh, don't ever forget that thoughts have consequences. Uh, Victor Hugo said that ideas can actually be more powerful than armies. And a single thought, a single idea uh, would end the life of over six million people. Uh, this brings me to the story of a young uh, doctor, a Jewish doctor living in Austria uh, by the name of Viktor Frankl. Uh, Viktor Frankl, if you know anything about him, he specialized in psychiatry and neurology. And uh, in 1938, he was made uh, chief of those departments at a hospital in Vienna. Uh, in 1942, however, uh, his life would be upended uh, when he, his wife, his parents, and his brother uh, were all arrested by the Nazis and were sent to various death camps. Uh, the suffering that Viktor Frankl and his family would face and, and other Jewish people would face is really beyond words. It, it's beyond our ability to even begin to fathom and imagine what they faced and what they went through. Uh, upon arrival, the Jewish people, many things would happen, but just to give you a sense, if you've not read about this or you've not refreshed lately, upon arrival, they would be stripped naked. It, 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 was, it was an act of humiliation and you were stripped naked in front of your children, in front of your spouse, in front of your parents, in front of your friends. And, and they would take every bit of the hair off your body. And, and it was just this unimaginable thing that they would make the Jewish people do. And, and then you became nameless. Uh, you would never be referred to your name by the Nazis, just the number that was tattooed on your arm. Uh, when Viktor Frankl uh, showed up in the first prison camp that he was sentenced to, um, again, he's a psychiatrist, he's a neurologist. Uh, he began to serve people. I mean, imagine that. He began to serve people in, in the extermination camps. Uh, he began to serve people who were on the verge of suicide, who were at the very edge of despair. And he actually began to form support groups among different Jewish people in the death camps so that they could be a safety net for one another, so they could support one another and encourage one another. Um, while at the camps, uh, you probably know this from history, uh, the Jewish people were fed less than 700 calories a day, but were forced to do strenuous labor. They were forced to work outside so that they would smell the stench of death, uh, the stench of their fellow Jewish brethren and sisters who were put into the gas chambers and then to the ovens. 
Uh, Victor Frankl's parents were killed, his dad in Terrazin, uh, his mom and his brother at Bergen-Belsen. Uh, his wife was initially sent to Auschwitz, and when she arrived at Auschwitz, she was uh, made to have a forced abortion. Later on, she would be placed in the gas chambers and the furnace herself. Um, eventually, Frankl was sentenced to go to Auschwitz himself. Uh, but before he was put to death, uh, he and 700,000 of his Jewish friends were rescued by Allied forces when they liberated the camp in 1945. Uh, Viktor Frankl uh, would go on to write uh, a book that I think everybody should read or listen to. It, it's a masterpiece. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. It's not the easiest read in the world, but it is, it is worth the read. Uh, but in A Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl talked about one of the insights that he gained from what he heard and what he saw and what he felt and what he experienced. And this is what he said. He said, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing. You can take my dignity. You can take my humility. You, you, you can take my, you, you can take everything from me. But you can't take the last of human freedoms to choose one's own way. In the end, you cannot take my choice away. You cannot take my choice of how I respond to what you're doing to me. You cannot make me forfeit my choice to still have hope in the face of hopelessness. You cannot cause me to forfeit my choice to see light even in the darkest night. He, he would go on to say, when we are no longer able to change the situation, and he was unable to change the situation, his family was unable to change the situation, the Jewish people were unable to change their situation. He says, when we're no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And I'm convinced he's right because we all get to choose the direction of our lives. And in choosing the direction of our lives, we all in part get to choose the destination where our lives end up. Um, here's something else I'm convinced is true. And this is the reason why we're doing this series. I'm convinced on a fundamental level that this is true of every reasonable functional person. So if you're reasonable and you're functional, first of all, congratulations. Second, here's what I think we have in common. This is what I think is true, fundamentally true of every reasonable, functional person. They desire better. We desire better. Every reasonable, functional person, we have a desire to do better. We have a desire to be better. And when I'm talking about better, I'm talking about improvement. Uh, when I'm talking about better, I'm talking about enhancement. I'm talking about development. I'm talking about involvement. I'm talking about advancement. Uh, when I'm talking about better, I'm talking about personal growth. I'm talking about relational growth. I'm talking about spiritual growth. The idea of better for reasonable people, functional people, the idea of better is a, it's attractional. It's attractive to us. We're drawn to the idea of better. We're drawn to the image of better. We're drawn to the vision of better. Uh, when we think about what it would look like, what it would feel like, when we envision being a better man, guys, don't we do that? We imagine being a better version of the man that we currently are. You know, or, or maybe ladies, you think about being a better woman than what you currently are. And when you envision that, when, when you have an image of what that would look like and you get a sense of what that would be like, that's attractive, we're drawn to that. Uh, when you think about being a better mom or a better dad or a better leader, or a better friend, a better employer, a better employee, when you think about being better, there's something attractive about that. The vision of better, we love that. That's the way God wired us. God wired us to want better. He wired us to want to grow personally, relationally, spiritually. And when it comes to better, the idea of better is anchored to two anchoring propositions. And, and those propositions or simply this, who could I be, who I should be? Who I could be, who I should be. Uh, who I could be is all about potential. It's like, I've got the potential for better. I've got the potential to develop. I've got the potential to be different than I am. Uh, could be is about what's imaginable. It's about what's possible. It, it's about what's plausible. It, it, it's the thing that inspires us. It's compelling. It's energizing. It's, it's what's big yet achievable. It's big. I mean, man, it's big. It's so good. It's, it's so much better. It's, it's a big idea. It's a big vision, but it's also achievable. Should be, however, that's about what's needed. That's about what's required. That's about what's demanded. That's what's necessary mandatory, expedient, essential, fundamental, indispensable, crucial, vital. What I could be, what I should be. 
Now, our thoughts often go like this. See, see if you um, have ever thought this way. You know what? I could do better. I could do better. I should do better. Uh, we think thoughts like this. I, I could be different. Matter of fact, I should be different. I, I could be less negative. I should be less negative. I could be, I should be less moody, less judgmental. I, I, I could grumble less. I should grumble less. I, I could parent different. You know what? I should parent different. I could be, I should be more kind, less sensitive. I, I should be more active. I, I, I should be, could be more forgiving, more gracious. I could worry less. I should worry less. I, I could not let fear dictate my life so much. You know what? I should not let fear dictate my life so much. And the list just goes on and on and on. You have your list. I have my list. What I could be, what I should be. But here's the uncomfortable, inconvenient truth of the matter. There's only one thing that stands between you and better. There's only one thing that stands between me and better. There's only one thing that stands between us and what we could be and what we should be. And the thing that stands in between us is change. Let's all just say this out loud together. Change. What's the thing that stands between us and better? Change. What's the thing that stands between what I could be and what I should be? Change. Perhaps a change of habits, a change of attitude, a change of perspective, a change in my core beliefs, a, a change in my limiting beliefs, a change to be less cynical or less suspicious of people, a, a change in my values, a change in my priorities, a change of the impulse and in influences in my life, a change of routine, a, a change in my emotional state. A change in the actions that I take, the choices that I make. A change in identity, how I see myself. The thing that stands between us and ultimately who we could be and who we should be is change. And just not change, but positive change. And here's the thing about positive change. Positive change is oftentimes not easy. It can be hard. It can be daunting. Uh, it can be overwhelming. It can be scary, it can be intimidating, it can even be confusing because you know, you know you need to change, I know I need to change, but sometimes I don't even know where to start. It's like, where do I even start? The, the list is big, the list is wide. I, I don't even know where to start and so it can be a bit confusing and so confusing we don't ever start. If change were easy, everybody would be doing it. But most people don't because it's not so easy. Uh, see if this sounds familiar or if this is just me. We say we're going to change because we know what we could be and we know what we should be. And then we make some kind of semblance of a commitment to change. And then we may even go so far to promise ourselves that we're going to change, that, that things are going to be different. And then we get the people closest to us and we promise them, we tell them, hey, things are going to change. I'm going to be different. Things are going to change. I'm going to be different. But what happens? Something doesn't take place and we just end up frustrated and we just end up irritated and tired and angry and in the end things don't change and we're no different we wanted things to change and we wanted to be different but we just didn't get there because without change without positive change we all get stuck we choose status quo we repeat past patterns I think probably you feel like this. I think I feel like this. There's, there's parts of our life where perhaps this haunts us. We just feel stuck. Nothing changes. We don't change. And don't forget this. By changing nothing, nothing will change. See, that's deep. That's why you come here. That's why the Creek Church, it elevates the product. Because we tell you things that you just never would have known otherwise. By changing nothing, nothing will change. We don't move forward. And listen to this. When we're not moving forward we in a sense stop living because living things grow. And when we aren't growing, you and I, we don't feel alive. That's how God wired us. When we're not growing, when we're not moving forward, when we're not having progress, we get discouraged, we become indifferent, we get inactive, and then we're just left unhappy. But when we're getting better, I'm talking about stronger, deeper, greater. Let me tell you what happens. Life begins to bubble up. Passion gets awakened, momentum ensues, and excitement just shows up. And now we've got a brand new skip in our step. We're breathing deeper, we're seeing clearer, and we feel better because we are doing better. And that makes life better. Not on some superficial level, but on a fundamental level. 
life gets better. The big idea is this, that life doesn't get better by chance, it gets better by change. Again, I I want us to speak this and I want us to hear this and I want us to get it in there. So everybody here in London, Williamsburg, Somerset, Bell County, let's all say this out loud together. Life doesn't get better by chance. It gets better by change. Change doesn't happen passively in your life or my life. Positive change doesn't happen passively. We have to pursue it. We have to be hungry for it. We have to want it. We have to take action and go after it. And then we gotta have the grit and the resolve and the perseverance to stay after it. You got to get after it and you got to stay after it. If you don't get after it, if you don't stay after it, change doesn't happen. So the question then for you, for me, for us, it's the million dollar question. How do we change? What do we do? Where do we start? What does it look like? How do we undo the healthy, harmful patterns of emotions we feel, the choices we make, the actions we take, the habits we form? And all those things that we repeat time and time and time and time and time again, and they get embedded into the very fabric of who you are and who I am. How do we restructure our life? How do we reorganize our life? And the answer is by changing our mind. Thus, this series, Change Your Mind. That's how we change. If you don't change your mind, you won't ever change. It doesn't matter how much discipline you may have. It doesn't matter how much willpower you may have. It doesn't matter how much information you may have. It doesn't matter how many people you may have in your corner. If you don't change your mind, you won't ever change. But here's the good news. If you're willing to change your mind, you can change your life. If you are willing to elevate your thinking, you can elevate your life. If you're willing to enhance your thinking, you can enhance your life. If you're willing to deepen your thinking, you're able to deepen your life. If you can improve your thinking, you can improve your life. If you can better your thinking, if I can better my thinking, we can better our life. King Solomon, who was the ancient sage of Israel, a king known for his wisdom, he said this. You've probably heard this verse before. For as he thinks in his heart, As a man thinks in his heart, as a woman thinks in her heart, so is he, so is she. Uh, The New American Standard Bible puts it this way. For as he thinks within himself, so is he. Another version says, for as he calculates in his soul, so is he. Another version says, for as he thinks in his soul, so is he. Uh, I'm a bit partial to the new American. For as he thinks within himself, so is he. In other words, your thinking creates your reality. Reality is not thrust upon you. You're not victimized by reality. You're not taken captive by reality. Your thinking, my thinking, actually is what creates our reality. As a person thinks, so is he. That's his place within reality, and it's established by his or her thoughts. This is what Solomon knew 700 years before Jesus would ever show up on the shores of Galilee. Here's what Solomon knew. The quality of our life is inextricably connected to the quality of our thoughts. The quality of your life, the quality of your life, the quality of my life, it's inextricably connected to the quality of our thoughts, of our thinking. Solomon seemed to know that our lives are moving in the direction of our strongest, most compelling, most reoccurring thoughts. Whatever most reoccurring thoughts you have, that's the direction your life is going. That's how your reality is being constructed. Your strongest thoughts, that's the direction that your life is moving. The most compelling thoughts you have, that's the direction that my life is moving. Because our thoughts are like magnets and they draw us in the direction that they're headed. It's our thinking more than anyone or anything else that shapes the quality of our lives. We love to blame things and we love to blame people and events and experiences and our past and our family and our friends, our spouses, our children, our job, our employer, our employees. And we just blame everybody for the lack of quality in our lives. But nothing affects the quality of our life. No one affects the quality of our life as much as the quality of our thinking. Our thinking has the power to free us or enslave us, to make us stronger or weaker, to make us healthy or sick, 
The the power of our thinking, it determines how we navigate through life. It determines how we interact with each other. It, It begins to inform the quality of our relationships. It begins to inform the quality of our emotional state. When we take control of our thoughts, we're taking control of our life. And that's what this series is all about. And today is just a big introduction to where we're headed. So I, I want you to lean in. I want you to listen. If it requires getting your phone out and, you know, putting notes into the note app or if you got a pen with you, I'm just telling you, this stuff is important. And I, I'm just going to give you just a, a little bit of this because this is not about me, but, but I, I had to dig into this over the last few months, not for the sake that I knew I was going to talk about it because I didn't have a plan to talk about it, but I needed to get some of this stuff into me. And as a result of doing all that I could to get this stuff into me, I, I feel like I've learned some things. I feel like I've picked up some things. Not there. We're on the journey together. But, but what I'm talking about is some, it's the place that I've been living uh, for the past uh, few months and for the past few weeks. These are things that I've been trying to lean into. And I'm telling you, When we take control of our thoughts, we're taking control of our lives. There's nothing more frustrating and powerless to feel like we're not in control of our lives. And sometimes we have faulty thinking that says, I'm not in control of my life. We are in control of our lives. You are in control. I'm in control of the quality and the direction of my life because I'm in control of my thoughts. And it's my thoughts more than anyone or anything else that affects the quality of my life and the quality of your life. Listen, our thoughts have consequences. We love to talk about, hey, children, your, your actions have consequences. Okay, that's good. That's true. Uh, we love to think in terms of our actions having consequences. But let's back up. Let's go to the headwaters. And, and let's go to where it all starts. And let's understand that our thoughts have consequences. And the thoughts that we have and that you have and that I have, the consequences result in emotions, beliefs, attitudes, My identity, the actions that I take, the habits that I have, every emotion that we have, every emotion that we have begins with a thought. Every emotion that you feel, it begins with a thought, not an event, not an interaction, not information. It begins with a thought. It's your thought about that event. It's your thought about that interaction. It's your thought about that information that shapes your emotions. So this is why this is important. You can change your emotions by changing your thoughts. You don't have to feel that way. You choose to feel that way. And I know you're pushing back. You don't like the thought of that because it makes your feelings your responsibility and not somebody else's. And it's easier to blame somebody else for the way that you feel than taking responsibility for the way that you feel. It's easy for me to blame other people for how I feel than take responsibility for it. But you can change your emotions by changing your thoughts. And that should be good news. That that should be great news. Now, thoughts over time, not only do they create emotions, but they create beliefs. And our beliefs are the lens through which we see the world and interpret the world. It it shapes how we think about the things that happen to us. And, And not only that, but our beliefs, your beliefs, my beliefs, begin to shape not only what I see, but what I look for. Thoughts lead to emotions and beliefs. And those beliefs over time form attitudes. And attitudes are just a settled way of feeling about a person, a situation, about things. Here's an example I think we can all understand. You get a negative thought about a person. You tell yourself, I tell you what, I think they're just an arrogant jerk. Let me tell you what will begin to happen. It will create an emotion inside of you concerning that person. You'll begin to form beliefs around the idea, oh, this is just, he's an arrogant jerk. She's just this, they're just that. And then that belief system becomes an attitude and now that's what you're looking for because you're wired to have bias in the direction of what you believe to be true. So now every opportunity that you have to have an interaction with him or her, you're looking for anything and everything that will substantiate that belief, those sets of emotions. And this is why our thinking is so vital and so crucial. It's so important because what you think is having practical application, practical consequences in every part of our life. We got beliefs about life, belief about God, belief about people, beliefs about ourselves, which namely is our identity, who we are, what we think we're capable of. 
and who we think we are. We have this, you know, this wired in thing inside of us, it seems like, that we want to be consistent with who we think we are. So if you tell yourself you're a loser, you're going to find a, self, you're going to find a way to lose. If you tell yourself that you're a failure, you're going to fail, you're going to, find a, you're going to find a way to fail because we want to be consistent in who we think we are. Nothing affects the quality and the direction of our life, the experiences of our life, the relationships of our life, like thoughts, our thinking, our mind, who you believe you are, it either limits you or it empowers you. Our thoughts begin to form choices and those choices become action and repeated actions They become a pattern. They become what we would call habits, a tendency, a practice, a way of life. And this begins to be the entirety of our life. And once it's a habit, listen to this, once it's a habit, we begin to go that way, we begin to do those things, we begin to feel that way without even having to think about it. Because now it's just a way of life. Our thoughts are the architect of our reality and our destiny. And I'm telling you, this is so big. And if I could just grab all of us by the shoulder and say, listen, you can't miss a word. Not because they're my words, but because this could radically, dramatically, legitimately change your life, my life, our life. Reality is the quality of my life. Direction is the destiny of my life. And my thoughts determine both, the quality of my life and the destiny of my life, the reality that I'm in and the destiny that I'm headed toward. That's my thoughts. That's the power of your thoughts. And we should just stop and think about that for a moment. The reality of my life and the destiny of my life, it's connected to my thinking. It's connected to my thoughts. We have control. This is so great. This is the grace of God. This is the goodness of God. God has delegated the control of your life to you. He gave you the ability to change your thinking and ultimately to change your life. And not only to experience a reality based on how you think, but also that shapes the destiny of where you want to end up. And this is what the scripture, this is what Solomon's talking about. This is what the scripture talks about. Everything begins with a thought. Everything. Emotions, beliefs, attitudes, identity, action, habits. We talk about those things and we should talk about those things. But all of those things begin with a thought. The way you feel begins with a thought. The choices you make, the actions you take, it started with a thought. The habits you develop, it begins with a thought. The identity that you have ascribed to yourself, it begins with a thought. And when we take control of our thoughts, we take control of the things which organize and structure our lives. So change, positive change, begins with a change of thinking. And this brings us to Jesus, the genius of Jesus. What was Jesus' first message? What was his sermon? Well, Matthew says that when Jesus showed up on the pages of history, he began to preach. What is this word? Talk to me. Repent. repent. I, I, couldn't re- I couldn't hear you. What is it? Repent. repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. You can't say the word repent and whisper. Repent. <laughs> repent. Repent! You know, that's how we heard it and, you know, when the evangelist came to town. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, for, for those of us who grew up in church, uh, let me see how, uh, see a hand. So how many of y'all say you grew up in church? Okay, some of, some of you were spared what some of us are still getting therapy for. Um, <laughs> repent is not an emotional word, though we thought it was. We're supposed to cry, feel sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry I did that. I feel like a fool. I'm such a failure. Oh, my Lord. You know, and the old timers, they would look at the people who'd come to the altar, and, and when they didn't have any tears, they didn't repent. That wasn't real. That wasn't real. Because we thought it was an emotional word. Uh, We even thought it was a spiritual word. But it's not so much. It's a cerebral word. It's an intellectual word. It's It's a mental word. And it literally means change your thinking. Jesus showed up and his first message to the world was change your thinking. Because Jesus knew you can't change your life unless you change your thinking. If you take control of your thinking, you can take control of your life. So Jesus said, repent, change your mind. Change your mind about God, change your mind about life, change your mind about people, change your mind about you. 
Because when we change our thinking, we are forced to let go of status quo. When we change our thinking, we get unstuck. We begin to feel different. We begin to believe different. We begin to act different. Our attitude gets different. When we change our thinking, we begin to change. It's not, it's not figurative. It's literal, literal change. It's emotional change, philosophical change, behavioral change, even physiological change within your body, how you feel physically, how you look dispositionally, how you function cellularly and genetically. What science is learning about the power of the mind and our body comes right alongside of what Solomon said in Proverbs 27, three, that as we think, so are we. And it helps us understand why Jesus showed up and said, hey, the first thing I need to tell you is you need to change the way you're thinking because thoughts are powerful. And everything in your life, everything you feel, everything you do, who you think you are, the habits, the attitude, it all begins with a thought. And if you learn to control your thoughts, you are also learning how to control everything in your life that makes you feel like you have no quality of life. So you can take it back. You can take responsibility for it. I can take responsibility for it. Listen, I can spend all of my time blaming her, blaming him, blaming them, blaming the world for how I feel, how I don't feel, why I am the way that I am, why I respond the way that I respond, why I react the way that I react. Or I can just sit down and relearn what I already know to be true. Everything begins with a thought. Look around. Look at the room you're in. Look around. I'm serious. Look around. Now, you're just looking at me. Look around. Look up. Look down. Look around. The room that you're in started with a thought. It started with a thought. The car you drove in today to church, it started with a thought. Everything starts with a thought. And so Paul, Paul comes along and we're, we're, we're going to revisit a lot of these same scriptures over the next few weeks. But Paul says this. He, he, he picks up on what Solomon was saying and what Jesus was saying. He says, therefore, I want to urge you. I want to urge you. I want to implore you. I want to encourage you, brothers, sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, your, your life, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We, we've heard these verses before, but, but here, here's, Mo, here's Paul. He's focusing on God's mercies, you know, God's rich in mercy. His mercies, you know, as, as Jeremiah would say, they are new every single day. Look at God's grace towards you. Look at God's love for you. And when you think about God's mercy, God's love, God's grace, do you just sense that motivation that comes with that? The motivation to want to respond to that? That God has been so good and you're so grateful for how good God's been. It just, you just kind of want to do something about it. And he says, that's a living sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice. Not a half living sacrifice, but a living sacrifice. A life given to God. A life that exists for God. And, and he's talking about a life of faith. Faith that integrates into all the areas of our life our emotions, our actions, our thoughts, our identities, our habits, our choices. He's talking about faith that begins to diffuse throughout all the compartments of your life and my life. A living sacrifice that is full of life. Listen to me. Not barely hanging on to life. Not a sick life. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about a life that's just down, no quality, no joy, no peace, no abundant life that Jesus talked about. A life full of life. That's the sacrifice that God's looking for. That's the sacrifice that he invites. A life that is full of life. A life of quality. A life that's headed towards a worthy destiny. Our life is a gift from God. And when we live life fully alive, that's our gift back to God. And Paul calls that worship. The scripture calls it faith. And Paul says, when that happens, God is pleased. Worship is, is not a segment of the service. Worship is life. It's living life. 
as we got through talking about in the last series, living life to the full, numbering every day, seeing it as the gift and the special occasion that it is. It's the abundant life Jesus spoke about. So Paul says, this, this, is, this is what it's supposed to be. This is, this is the faith that we're living out. And he says, so do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't settle for living like everybody else. If you're going to go out to eat today, I just, I just encourage you to look around at the restaurant. Tell me how many happy people you see. T- tell me how many people are smiling. Tell me how many people are laughing. Tell me how much sparkle you see in people's eyes. How much vigor for life do you see? When you go to the office, how much life do you see? How much life are you encountering? That's the pattern of the world, miserable, superficial, shallow life, roller coaster living. He says, don't be conformed to that. Don't believe like everybody else. Don't have the attitude that everybody else has. Don't go around feeling like everybody else. Don't settle for the same perspective and adopt the same philosophy. Don't be put in that mold. Paul says, I'm going to give you an invitation to change, to change directions, to switch paths, to, to be fundamentally altered on the deepest level. I'm going to invite you to restructure and reorganize your life, to change your emotional state, your emotional health, to change your attitude, to change your perspective and your perceptions, your value, your identity. I'm going to invite you to change all of that. Sounds like a big ticket. Sounds like, sounds difficult. Sounds hard. He said, let me tell you how you do it. By the transformation that occurs by renewing your mind. Don't be conformed to be like everybody else, but be transformed, be changed, be made new by the renewing of your mind. In other words, if you change your thinking, you can change your life. Paul puts an amen to what Solomon said. And he puts an amen to what Jesus invited us to do. And Paul would say, if you don't change your mind, you're never going to change your life. If you don't change your mind, you're never going to change the way you feel. You're never going to improve the quality and the direction of your life. If you don't change the way that you think, your choices are going to be no different. Your actions are going to be no different. Your habits, they're going to remain intact. But if you're willing, if, if you're willing to change your thinking, if... You are willing to change your thinking. Paul says, you can change your life. And he says, this is where fundamental change, lasting change, positive change, this is where it begins. This is where it's sustained. This is where it's strengthened by controlling and changing our thoughts. It doesn't happen in a service. It doesn't happen with a touch. It doesn't happen. Be good if it did. But you can be touched. You can be slain. You can be prayed for, prayed over. You can read the Bible ad nauseum. You can pray for hours. But if you do not, and if I do not change the way that I think, my life, your life, our life will not change. Paul says we can't elevate our life by elevating our thinking. We can improve our life by improving our thinking. We can change our reality by changing the way that we think. We can alter our destiny by changing the way that we think. Your thinking, my thinking does not have to reflect your biology, where you came from, your mom, your dad, your grandfather, your grandmother. It does not have to reflect your history, what has happened to you, what didn't happen for you. It does not have to reflect your environment. Your thinking, my thinking, our thinking, it can transcend our biology. We don't have to think the way we were raised. We don't have to think according to our history and all the bad things and all the harmful things and all the hurtful things and all the baggage. And it doesn't have to be with what's going on around us, who they are, what they said, what they didn't do. Our thinking can transcend all of that. And we can take control of our lives when we take control of our thinking. Because the quality of our life will never surpass the quality of our thinking. Paul says, you'll have a new way of life when you adopt a new way of thinking. Now, I'm going to give you this and we'll wrap it up. But your brain, the mind and the brain, you know, we wonder how do they work together? You know, does the brain give rise to the mind, which the materialist would say? Or we believe that the mind controls the brain. 
that our mind leads our brain. Your brain has 100 billion different neurons or brain cells in it, capable of 100 trillion neurological connections. I mean, your brain can't even comprehend what your brain can do. Think about that for a moment. Talk about irony. Every thought we have, every thought, now listen to me. Don't, don't, don't let me lose you. Every thought that you have forms a connection or reinforces a connection in your brain. And every time you have a thought and every time I have a thought, your brain physically changes. The landscape of your brain changes. Thoughts, you know, I, maybe once upon a time I thought thoughts were abstract. Thoughts were immaterial. But thoughts are not abstract. They're not immaterials. They are physical. Wonderful, complicated things happen in your brain and mind when we have a thought. Chemicals, physical chemicals are released when you have a thought. Proteins are formed. Those chemicals unlock your DNA. Take out the code for making protein. Those proteins are formed. There's electromagnetic, electrochemical, quantum activity that happens on the deepest level of who you are and who I am. There's vibrations and there's frequencies that form signals and communication that facilitate connections and strengthen connections, even affecting us at the cellular level. That's why toxic thoughts are toxic to the body. They're toxic to your cells. They're toxic to your immunity. They're, They're toxic to your genetics. Toxic thoughts are toxic to the body because thoughts are powerful. They affect our physiology. They affect the way we stand and the way we feel and the way our face looks. And thoughts are powerful. Those connections become a way of life, a way of thinking, a way of feeling, a pattern, a habit that's consequential. But Paul says we can literally make our brains different. I'll give you this little picture. We're going to come back to it. These are, these are the connections that take place in our brain, and there's frequencies and vibrations, and there's chemicals, and there's proteins. And every single one of these things started with a thought, and it's a connection, and, and it's an identity, and it's a behavior, and it's an emotion, and it's all of these things. You say, well, what is this? What are you trying to say? Paul says, some of you need to change the very fabric of your brain because the reason you can't stop feeling the way you feel you've wired yourself to feel that way the reason that you can't change the way that you've acted and the way that you you know the things that you choose to do is because you've wired it into yourself but he says you can be transformed by the making new of your brain because when you choose to think a new way a new connection happens a new pathway is formed And when you enforce that new way of thinking, that positive way of thinking, that healthy way of thinking, in time, those old connections are stripped powerless. And you become new, stronger, better. The first step to changing is first thinking and knowing that you can. You can take control of the way you feel. You can control your mindset. You can take control of undermining actions and decisions and attitudes and habits and I can so let's take responsibility for what God has made our responsibility in doing so shaping both our reality and our destiny and let's know and let's believe and let's lean into that the quality the quality of our life is tied to the quality of our thinking there's change in you There's better in you. There's a quality of life that you can have that's already in you. When we take control of our thoughts, we take control of our lives. This is God helping us. This is God wiring us this way. You can't change your destination in a moment, but you can change your direction in a heartbeat by thinking. And here's what Paul says, and this is the end. Paul says, you can be made new. Because inside of you, you have the power of resurrection. The same spirit which raised Jesus from the dead, it lives in you. Your old way of thinking, your old way of feeling, your old way of being and acting and choosing, your old attitudes and old habits, they can die. And new life can be resurrected. There's better in you. There's stronger in you. There's greater in you. There's maturity in you. There's potential in you. There's joy and peace and love and forgiveness and a passion and an excitement for life that's in there that God said, you change your thinking, you can change your life. 
Heavenly Father, I pray that you help us take kind of this starting point today. And in the weeks to come, how we begin to to live this out, practical tools, practical handles that can improve the reality and the destiny of our lives, the quality, the direction of our lives. God, thank you that you wired us with the capacity to change, to be different that the same spirit which raised Jesus from the dead, it lives in us. You've given us the capacity to rewire our brains, to be renewed in our thoughts, to change our lives when we change our thinking. So God, let that begin today and let us lean in and let us embrace the idea that we can take control of our lives when we begin to take control of our thinking. And as a result of that, may new life, resurrection life come to be in me, in all of us, in Jesus' name.